coffee big cup and hello welcome back to another episode of the gilmore way podcast the court calls the state versus lorelei gilmore on the docket for this episode is an indictment of the depiction of the court proceedings for the accused in this episode. I am so excited for this discussion. It's one of the earliest scripts I started working on when we started talking about doing a podcast. As someone with an academic background in legal studies, an avid watcher of LawTube, and someone with work experience in the court system of Ontario, and as a real estate and corporate legal assistant, I have thoughts. <laughs> about this plotline and about whether Rory's punishment was truly just in light of the severity of her crime. Court is now in session. Uh, silence in the courtroom, please, ladies and gentlemen. We cannot order, have order. We cannot have any disruptions, um, including any kitty noises for any cats that may be running around the apartment right now. Please be quiet. Um, in the meantime, in order to continue to support and fund the court system, uh, your counsels for this afternoon ask that you do all of those YouTube things for us. Please like this video, subscribe to our channel. It is just one click below and any support really does help us out. Um, and if you want to share it with your family and friends, please feel free. And if you have any hot takes on whether Rory's sentencing as a result of her Bodie boat theft was proper or not, please drop us your comments below and let us know where you stand. Yes. And reminder, spoilers all. We will be spoiling a lot in this episode. Spoiler, spoiler. Rory stole a boat, you guys. Oh, Grand Theft Boating. Anyway, I, like, I'm so ready for this episode. I have my Emily D. Baker I Have Questions mug. And I am wearing a, a shirt which most closely resembles a robe and dicky, which is what we wear in Canada um, in Superior Court. So, <laughs> you, you mostly only see it in like British TV shows, the the whole regalia. You guys, I don't think any of your courts wear it. Maybe the Supreme Court, maybe. <laughs> um, but I, I thought it was fitting. Anyway, let's get to the topic at hand. I'm gonna start by throwing you a question. Um, I feel like, what, two plus years ago, before we started this podcast, you and I had a whole Slack conversation, <laughs> just back and forth, huge chunks of text about uh, about this whole situation. Mm -hmm. And we were definitely like not on the same page about it. So I'm going to start with you. Do you think that Rory's punishment was justified? Why or why not? Yeah, um, I'm pretty much going to fall in line with my position as it was then. Um, and, and maybe there are slight minimal like modifications I would make to it now but I think I'm still in line with the fact that yes predominantly I feel on the whole uh ro what Rory did get hit with was justified um we'll talk about what exactly the repercussions were of her stealing this boat in terms of the community service probation aspect of things I probably would have maybe lessened the community service hours that she got hit with. But I feel like her original sentencing recommendation and the agreement that was made with the prosecutor was not even a slap on the wrist. I feel like it was just, you know, a, a kid who said a bad word and go into timeout for 10 minutes. And I think it needed to be a little bit more than that. Not at the end of the day, what she did get hit with. I think there was a nice middle ground there that I would have liked to have settled on. But on the whole, I'm more okay with upping the sentence and, and having it fall in line with more of what we saw her get hit with than what was originally presented and what she expected to have happen. So yeah, I think that with a few modifications that it was very fair and it was what she needed to accept as fair and legal repercussions for what she did. Interesting. Um, I guess... We should remind everybody too what the sentence actually was in case you haven't watched this episode a gajillion times like we have. She was hit with 300 hours of community service, one year's probation, and she had to wait five years to have this expunged from her record. That's pretty steep. And I have some comparables later that we'll get to discussing. But I personally did not like the sentence and I, I don't love the way in which the judge pronounced this. So I'm actually going to read the quote 
<laughs> before I do that, I just want to point out. So like I have every transcript for every episode. Um, I pulled them all when we were doing our Gilmore's Against Humanity game. And um, I just I noted like a funny uh, transcription error. Um, I think some of these come from may like maybe even AI or like some sort of like digital version or they um the captions. Uh, and so sometimes you get like funny spelling mistakes. And there's a line where she says, you further understand that by doing so, accepting the plea, um, that you waive your right to trial via a jury of your peers. And it's funny because wave is spelled W-A-V-E <laughs> and peers is spelled P-I-E-R-S. And I was like, <laughs> lol but, um, at this typo considering she stole a yacht. But um, um, anyway, that was just a funny side note. I thought people might get a chuckle out of that. Okay, so uh, this is the judge's commentary on this. And this is where I take issue because it's wholly inappropriate. <laughs> so I understand that the defense is portraying this as a childish lark, a youthful indiscretion. Well, I take the law very seriously. And if there is one thing I have very little tolerance for, it is rich, privileged children viewing the world as their private playground. I don't care who you are. I don't care who your family is. When you commit a crime, Miss Gilmore, there must be consequences, period. 20 hours of community service won't do it. I'm ordering 300 hours of community service to be completed in no more than six months. And one year's probation. Now, assuming this is indeed a one-time occurrence, at the end of five years' time, Ms. Gilmore can petition the court to have this expunged from her record. So, that's the judge's take on it. And it's just, it's one of those things where judges are not supposed to do that, generally speaking. Obviously, at the end of the day, the buck stops with them. They are the the legal experts who are there to mediate between the state and the defense to ensure that people are held responsible for the things that they do, for the antisocial behaviors that they partake in. But they're also there to make sure that the state doesn't trample on the rights of the people, right? You know, we have, well, you guys <laughs> have, we'll, we'll talk in American terms for the most part for this episode because this takes place in Connecticut. But you guys have a constitution <laughs> that protects you from you know, cruel and unusual punishments. Mm -hmm. And you have rights to due process and to have rules of of parity across the board where it's like people aren't supposed to be treated differently because they're rich and privileged and they're not supposed to be treated differently because they're poor and disenfranchised, right? And that sort of philosophy is, is starting to creep into this judge's decision-making in a way in which it shouldn't. It's like reverse discrimination where it's like, I don't like rich, privileged people. I have a chip on my shoulder. God knows why. There's plenty of legitimate reasons why she can dislike this, but she's not supposed to use that personal issue that she has with privilege and, and wealth in her decision-making because that's a slippery slope of, of being very uneven in the application of the law and sentencing principles that she's so uppity or like that's no, um, but she's, she's, saying that she's trying to take things seriously and trying to uphold the law, but she's also not necessarily following the principles herself. Technically, it, it's funny because most of what she put into place is technically within the realm of sentencing principles. But usually when you have a first time offender who has, as Charlie points out, otherwise demonstrably excellent character, those things are supposed to be taken into consideration and you're supposed to go very lenient for a first offense because, you know, there's nothing in their background that says like, hey, we have to go above and beyond this. And, and you know, we have to throw the book at them. Yeah, I agree. And, but I, I also have to counter it and say, too, that there are and it's sad that it happens, but there are a lot of instances within the American court system where rich where rich and privileged individuals get away with crimes because they are rich and privileged, whether there's payoff that's are payoffs that are happening, whether it's, Oh, I'll support you in the next upcoming political campaign. I'll endorse you, whatever um, bribery, whatever you want to call it, you know, even society race class can fall into all of those things. It does. And it has happened. So I almost wonder too, if this was a commentary on, you know, 
it's abhorrent that it does happen and we need to not allow it. And again, I fully agree with your point that regardless of financial means where you fall on the class spectrum, that there needs to be equal lateral judgment for all parties across the board. I almost wonder if this was just a knee jerk reaction to say like, and calling it out on like, this has happened in the past where the upper class can get away with things that they shouldn't. And so we're just trying to illustrate why that can't happen and why it's bad. But this was also not the correct response to that either in terms of going the opposite end of the spectrum and just imposing a judgment and a sentence that was not fitting of the crime. Yeah, that's the thing. Rory Gilmore is not, you know, supposed to be the poster child for don't go joyriding kitties, you know, they're not supposed to make examples out of any one person nonetheless a 20 year old kid who goes to Yale who was drunk and stupid one night you know this is not the proper venue to judge whether or not Rory Gilmore is an entitled jerk this is you know she has to deal with the facts and information before her and the reality is that the prosecutor made a determination it's the state's job to decide what to charge how to charge it and to recommend an appropriate sentence. And so, yeah, I agree that 20 hours is is a little minimal for what Rory did, especially given the value of the boat. But at the end of the day, you know, what she did was not terrible. It feels really terrible and egregious in the context of like, Rory Gilmore is this cute little bright eyed, perfect, shiny halo, gifted kid for the first couple seasons of the show and then she goes and does something very out of character and very dramatic and it feels like this huge thing and i think you're right that it was kind of supposed to be a commentary on like from the writer's perspective obviously a, a writer wrote this not a judge right <laughs> and so um obviously this whole show feels like an indictment of privilege and generational wealth to some degree and that comes through in how this particular scene was crafted but that doesn't mean that this is an appropriate or proportional sentence and so like like i said as someone who has a bit of a background in that i'm not a lawyer i have a political science degree i have a lot in society minor so i did a lot of criminology and law and society legal anthropology legal history legal philosophy all of those kinds of courses when I was in university and I've worked in courtrooms and I've worked in a law office. Although, you know, what's funny is like we pre-recorded so much in March for the coming weeks because we knew how busy we were going to be that we literally haven't recorded since I started my new job on the 1st of April. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the first time that I can say I'm a legal assistant now. I work in real estate and corporate law. And so, you know, there's just, I know things, you know, I work with a lawyer all the time. So, there's that but again not a lawyer so my understanding is still a little bit more academic and less practical but yeah i just that being said sentencing principles are something you learn um in the courses i took so when i watched this i was like no this would like almost never happen and and I think that's what, what got me is that it was so very clearly a writing device to make it seem super dramatic what she did and and drive a wedge between her and Lorelai. Yeah, I agree. We'll get to Lorelai's response as well as a part of this episode. But I also just wanted to say, like, as I was revisiting this episode and the more we're talking about it, like, I know you have a legal background. I have a background and my current career is like in insurance. My insurance brain with this episode just goes wild because thankfully it didn't happen. But what if there had been personal injury? What if there had been extensive property damage? What would the repercussions have been then? Would Rory have gotten hit with an even stricter sentence than what she did? Had, some, had there been a fatality, had there been any sort of injury, had the boat that they had stolen actually been damaged and brought back into the harbor or the marina with any any level of damage that would have needed repairs that are now a, a financial consideration. I think that her sentence 
as she received it, fell in line with the fact that none of those things had happened. But had those been a reality, now you're looking at fines, financial responsibilities for property damage, um, you know, lawsuits. Thankfully, again, it was just a scenario where the Coast Guard caught them, you know, arrested them, brought them back into the harbor. No one was hurt. The boat was fine. Seemingly, the boat owners just didn't even give to you know what's about it. But it could have been so much worse. And had it been, I think Rory's sentence would have been a lot different than what she got handed. It's true. Obviously, the mitigating factors are that there was no damage. Um, from what we gather, I mean, obviously Logan had been at the party for an hour and a half, but he didn't seem sloppy drunk. She seemingly came almost straight from work or straight from home, if you will. Um, I don't even think she didn't make it to the Gilmore's and isn't 21 yet and doesn't really drink there either, except maybe on special occasions. And so like, we have no indication that there were any enhancements for dangerous operation or for operating under the influence or anything like that. And so yeah, the fact that they, it, it was more of a trespass property crime than it was anything else. And like, obviously, it's always in the back of your mind that like, yeah, something really bad could have happened, um, but it didn't. And so the judge isn't supposed to be like, well, in these hypothetical scenarios, things could have been really bad. So I'm going to like give you 15 times the amount recommended by the DA, you know, um, that's, that's not necessarily her place to do that. But Let's let's backtrack this a little bit and, and talk about the actual charges and lay a little more foundation, pun totally intended, as to what we're dealing with here. So according to the transcript, Rory was charged under Section 117A of Penal Code. So this is 2005 Connecticut Code, Section 53A. Dash 117A criminal mischief in the fourth degree class D sorry class C misdemeanor. So they were wrong in the trans or yeah in the in the episode that they're wrong about what section of the penal code they're talking about to begin with. <laughs> so that is you know not very promising. So this section of the criminal penal code, sorry it's the the criminal code here and I keep wanting to call it that but the penal code, um, criminal mischief in the fourth degree. A person is guilty of criminal mischief in the fourth degree when having no reasonable ground to believe he has a right to do so, he intentionally or recklessly, one, damages or tampers with any fire hydrant or hydrant system owned by the state or a municipality, fire district or private water company, or two, damages, tampers with, or removes any tangible property owned by the state, a municipality, or a person for fire alarm, smoke detection, and alarm, fire suppressant, or police alarm purposes. <laughs> so that is the wrong section of the code. What they actually meant was section 117 which is the criminal mischief in the third degree class b misdemeanor a person is guilty of a criminal mischief in the third degree when having no reasonable ground to believe he has a right to do so he one intentionally or recklessly a damages tangible property of another or b tampers with tangible property of another and thereby causes such property to be placed in danger of damage or two damages intangible sorry, damages tangible property of another by negligence involving the use of any potentially harmful or destructive force or substance, such as but not limited to fire, explosives, flood, avalanche, collapse of building, poison gas, or radioactive material. So um, I think if memory of my research shows, what they actually did was probably a class A misdemeanor but she would have pled down to a class B misdemeanor and, and gotten a charge like this, which is tampering with property as opposed to um, some higher degree of, of criminal mischief, which would carry a heftier penalty. So misdemeanors in Connecticut, class A are the most serious, uh, punishable by up to 364 days in jail and a fine up to $2,000. Examples of class A misdemeanors include prostitution, third degree assault, criminal trespass, joyriding, and inciting a riot. So there we have joyriding. Class B misdemeanors are punishable by up to six months in jail and a fine of up to $1,000. Examples include unlawful assembly, third degree stalking, public indecency, and reckless endangerment. Class C might include stuff like petty larceny. This is grand larceny. If if it were charged as theft, which it's not because they didn't intend to keep the boat, um, but petty larceny and disorderly conduct, 
our class C. So while incarceration is a possibility, Connecticut law authorizes several sentencing options that avoid jail time. Certain nonviolent offenders might even qualify for pretrial diversion programs that avoid conviction. So, you know, um, basically she would charge, or sorry, she would plead down a class. That's, that's typically what they would offer you. They would say like, we won't charge these more serious things or it might have even been a class d or e felony because um what the judge said was you know you can revoke your plea and go to trial but if you do that you'll be facing additional felony charges and so either she pled from a felony down or she pled from a class a misdemeanor down so i guess it depends how they decide to charge it but that's up to the state how they want to do that and it's up to the state to suggest a sentence and usually judges are supposed to be like arbiters on the law they're not there to make personal judgments on like you know what i don't think this is enough i'm just gonna like give you a lot more mm -hmm. and i mean i would agree i think that's definitely what this judge did aside from the potential commentary that may have been being made by the writers you know especially when a deal with the prosecution had been outlined i think this judge was very much and you could probably speak to this a lot more than i can very much out of place to say no deal based on what you two have already aligned and i'm gonna throw the hammer down and hit you with this now again i stand by my previous statement that the deal that she had made with the prosecution was like putting her in time out for 10 minutes and and not enough but i don't think this judge was within her rights to do what she did at that moment in time in terms of saying 300 hours probation, you can try and expunge this in five years, get out of my courtroom. Yeah. All right. I also pulled some Connecticut sentencing principles for section 53A. Um, so what she did could have carried a term of imprisonment with the execution of such sentence of imprisonment suspended, which means not going to jail as long as within a period of time you follow certain conditions. Um, and a period of probation or a period of conditional discharge, they're fairly similar things. It's again, a community sentence with conditions and in, including reporting to a probation officer. Um, a term of imprisonment with the execution of such sentence of imprisonment suspended entirely or after a period set by the court and a fine and a period of probation. So she could have done jail, probation, fine. Um, a fine and an authorized sentence or an unconditional discharge. So basically that would be no jail, no probation, no conditions, but your record will still show a conviction. So especially for a first time offender, that wouldn't necessarily be out of the blue, you know? Um, and then often in imposing a sentence, you sort of alluded to this before and something that we didn't see is, um, whether there are any requests from victims for restitution. Obviously we hear that there was no dam or we don't think there was any damage to the boat. Um, it's never mentioned the, I, again, I'm surprised that the judge who seems to have an issue with rich privileged kids doesn't impose a fine or restitution. Like that would have been totally within her rights and she didn't do it. And so I'm, I'm confused by that. It's like, Clearly, you think she has means. She goes to a fancy Ivy League school. She must have money. So, like, why not impose that? Um, and it also goes to my issue of, like, the job of the courts is to, is, like, to make things right. You know, justice isn't just putting people away in jail or throwing the book at them. It's It's making victims whole. And it's preventing people from behaving in such antisocial ways. And so usually strict punishments are, are not necessarily deterrence because most people don't think they're going to get caught. It's the, the probability of getting caught that has more of a deterrent effect than harsh punishment because nobody thinks they're ever going to get it, least of all Rory Gilmore. Yeah. But do you think 
just based on what we saw then, that she should have anticipated that plea agreement not going or not aligning up with how it was. Like, did I, I, a better question I, I want to ask following up with this, should Charlie have prepared her and perhaps even Emily and Richard more with the knowledge of, hey, this is the agreement that we have with the prosecutor. We hope it goes down this way, but it may not line up one to one. Should he have counseled them better to expect maybe a bit of a harsher punishment or a deviation from that agreement? I guess it, it like, depends. Again, yeah, because again, they were obviously very dissatisfied with him at the end of the day as their counsel, not having prepared them enough for what happened. Yeah, it depends because there are certain types of plea agreements where it's just a recommendation from the prosecution and the judge makes the ultimate determination. And there are others where it's more like the judge almost always goes along with what the prosecution says, because again, it's the prosecution's job to know the facts, to meet with the accused and the victims and to understand what's going on, to make an appropriate recommendation to the court based on all of the mitigating and aggravating circumstances. And the judge usually just reviews it and imposes it in line with the prosecute with what the prosecution suggests. And so depending on the type of plea, um, Charlie probably didn't think that the judge was going to go rogue on this. And I think that's the intent of the writers was for this to feel like a judge going rogue. Um, as a way to make social commentary and to have Rory be surprised and to have the Gilmores outraged and all of that and to crap on Charlie Davenport <laughs> and the, um, the 20 year old prosecutor <laughs> or whatever it was, Richard called him, um, who was Gordy from Sabrina, the teenage witch, might I add, love that. <laughs> so yes and no. I mean, Again, the chances of a judge going that far outside the scope once a prosecutor has made their recommendation, it's not unheard of, but it's not that common. You know, if the prosecutor thinks this is appropriate, it it's not really the judge's place to be like, you're wrong. <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, the sentence should be based on what actually happened, not the philosophy of the judge. And that's clearly what happened here, which is part of why I take issue. It, I don't necessarily take issue with her, like I sort of do, but I sort of don't take issue with her upping it. Because like you said, 20 hours is a slap on the wrist. Um, but as I mentioned, 300 is 15 times, <laughs> like, it's like the 15 times the recommended. That is fairly egregious, not to mention the probation. I think the, the thing that gets me the most is probably the probation because that is typically a fairly stringent set of circumstances that you have to live under for a year. And part of why it bugs me so much is we never hear about it again. <laughs> she doesn't have a probation officer. She doesn't seemingly have to report. Um, she's not under any conditions. One condition that often comes up in stuff like this is no contact orders with co-accused. So either Logan was able to keep his name entirely out of this and that's why there was a no contact or why there was no no contact order or again the writers just had no idea what they were doing when it comes to what probation actually is. Um, and the five years to expunge her criminal record in Connecticut I'm pretty sure after three years for a misdemeanor, you can apply to the court to have your record expunged. I think it's five years for a felony and three for a misdemeanor. And so they weren't right about that either. Does that surprise us though? No, these are not legal analysts. These are television writers. Maybe would you, we should have had you writing this episode, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, the 20 hours does feel like a total low ball. But at the same time, I keep in mind that Vori is 20 and she's upset and she's otherwise an upstanding person. And again, like this isn't the place to judge Rory for cheating on her ex-boyfriend or for cheating with her ex-boyfriend and for 
calling a ballerina fat and for being a bad friend or, you know, this is, I think as an audience, we like to see Rory get hers when that's not the appropriate venue to do that. You know, like they're only supposed to be looking at the relevant facts, including the fact, like we haven't even touched on the fact that the, the victim of this crime was a rich doctor who had enough disposable income to have a non-necessity luxury yacht for his son and his girlfriend to have sex on. So considering this was on Rebecca Thurston's blog <laughs> and they clearly know who she is from going to Yale with her, I'm assuming that young Sir Zimmerman also goes to Yale. And so it's like the victims of this crime are also rich privileged people who probably raised a rich privileged kid. Yeah, and I mean, again, we've talked about how obviously the owner of the boat never was just like, I want, you know, compensation, even if there is no damage. He just, there was never anything sought out. He never showed up to court. There was seemingly never any request made of, oh, I want, again, any sort of compensation for damages. You know, I want even just a letter of apology. There was nothing. It just seemed like, Echoing what you said, this guy was just like, oh, stole a boat. I'm surprised my own kid didn't do it. Yeah, it's like, what if, I think his name was Jason Zimmerman? <laughs> what if he took out the boat and crashed it or whatever, you know? Like, the boat is, going to your earlier point, it's probably insured to high heaven. This is probably what, like a $100,000 luxury vehicle? And it's like, yeah, that makes this a really stupid thing to do on their part, but they didn't intend to keep the boat it was always meant to like blow off a little bit of steam and bring it right back and it's like if they hadn't been caught by the coast guard it would have been like hey we're back in the marina and this thing is like 50 dollars less in fuel you know <laughs> and there would be very little evidence of what happened or who did it except maybe some security cameras or whatever and then you know maybe they would have to instigate a criminal complaint after the fact if the Coast Guard didn't pick them up, if they felt like it was even worthwhile for them to do that. But yeah, the, like that's the thing that a lot of people miss about court is a lot of times victim impact is very impactful. That's why they call it victim impact. And in my opinion, <laughs> I think, especially you guys in the States, y'all are way too excited to throw people in jail <laughs> to like have that be your standard for what happens to people who do bad things when in reality that is not the best way to deal with lawbreakers As, like the large majority of them people who are non-violent and who commit lower degrees of crimes like um like drug offenses you know marijuana is still illegal in a lot of states and like up here i can go down the street and buy it in drink form and like candy form you know it's just it's these different ideas about what's okay and and how to go about things and what's often missed in a discussion of an eye for an eye or just you know throwing rory in jail for six months for joyriding um is that there would be a better way for her to learn a lesson than 300 hours of community service and a year of probation. And that would be, yeah, apologizing to the Zimmermans. It would be a fine. It would be restitution. It would be trying to make amends in some other way where she actually had to deal with the people that she hurt. Instead, she's been given 300 hours of community service, which is essentially indentured servitude and labor, <laughs> which, your country has a wild history when it comes to um, using prisoners as slave labor. Not even going to touch that because that's a whole other topic unto itself. But it's definitely something to keep in mind when considering, you know, the use of criminals as as free labor. Um, you know, by the end of her community service, do we think she's any better of a person? Not really. What would have maybe made her a better person is like actually f facing the people she hurt 
if you can even say that they were hurt in all of this. It doesn't, it seems like they were barely inconvenienced because they didn't even have to come to court. I don't even know if the prosecutors talked to them. The way that they wrote this, I'm not even sure <laughs> if they were considered in this. It's just like, no, you did a bad thing. I don't care who you did it to, but you, ma'am, are a rich, privileged, snotty kid who uses the world as her personal playground. And so she tried to impose this strict sentence to invoke some sense of justice but who was who was learning anything in this circumstance and like who was benefiting from it nobody because again going back to what you said this was probably an instance where they contacted the owner of the boat they were just like hey just want to let you know coast guard picked up these two individuals last night they were had been joyriding your boat on the other end okay was it damaged no okay well then Sir, do you want to press charges? No. I mean, if the boat's back and it's not damaged, um, I don't have the time or the desire or the money to want to get to want to get involved. There's no reason for me to do so. And that was that. And then the continued prosecution probably just stemmed from the fact that again the Coast Guard had picked them up, but the owner was seemingly not moving forward whatsoever. Which again, then is something that the judge would have probably had to have taken into consideration. But like that wasn't going on here. So it's just a knee jerk way too far on the other end of the spectrum to do this to Rory. And again, I don't think she's really learning. A, I mean, she's learning a lesson, hopefully, but not the, not in the best way because she's just being hit over the head with a book. Probably like the Webster's dictionary version of a book when it's like, maybe it should have just been like a 10 pager. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because in A House is Not a Home, uh, Colin and Finn say that they went joyriding on the Robinson's boat. Um, Robinson? Robertson? Something like that. Starts with an R. Um, and then by New and Improved Lorelei, it's the Zimmerman's boat. And I'm like, we couldn't even keep continuity on the name of the owner of the boat. That's how important the boat owner is in this whole thing. It's all about teaching Rory some sort of lesson and keeping her and Lorelai apart because of this big dramatic fallout. Um, and to me, that indicates that maybe Logan knew the boat owner and maybe that's why his prosecution went away and he didn't face any charges. But I think something a lot of people don't understand about criminal charges is that you don't always get the choice to prosecute or not to prosecute. Um, again, it's up to the state to lay criminal charges. So you can go make a criminal complaint, but that doesn't mean that an indictment will follow. And you can say, I don't wanna press charges. And that doesn't mean that someone won't be prosecuted. So once the government's involved, they get to make the call because they are the government, right? And you know, judges are part of like the judicial branch of the government, but the judicial branch keeps the executive branch in check, right? That's your division of powers. That's how that works, right? And so, it would have been more appropriate for the judge to step in if the prosecutor was like, we want 300 hours and we want two years of probation. It would have been her job to be like, I don't see that here. You know, I'm taking it down a notch. But instead, like I said, she reverse discriminated against someone for coming from a good family and perhaps having wealth and privilege and being like, I don't like your attitude. <laughs> yeah. And, and, but there wasn't even any attitude there. Rory was very respectful in the courtroom, answered her questions, did not speak up or was hostile or argumentative. So that judge definitely just needed to get off her power trip. Exactly. We have no damage to the boat. We have no resisting arrest. We have came to court on her own recognizance. We have respectful. We have no criminal history. We have accepting a plea at the first instance. This probably happened in like mid to late May and she has a court appearance by June 3rd and already has a plea deal knocked out with the prosecutor so that they don't have to waste court resources on any further litigation of this or trial, which is hugely resource intensive. Usually these things go to th like the mitigation of the sentence for someone, right? This is why you can plea and, and take a deal on something that's like maybe not as bad as you would have gotten if you tried to fight it, right? And so. 
that's another part of this that sort of bugs me where I'm just like, Rory literally did everything right. She is the poster child for like being a pretty good kid or at least one who keeps herself out of trouble. Lorelai says it herself. Like <laughs> one time she forgot to return a library book and she grounded herself, you know, like she's generally very rule abiding, has a lot of respect for, you know, the law and doing things right. Until now when she had a little bit of a minty bee and nobody seems to, you know, bring up the minty bee enough. <laughs> so ugh, like, I just, I think, like you said earlier, I think it should have been a happier medium where like maybe the prosecution deal was 50 to a hundred hours. Like, or maybe they said 50 and she said a hundred, you know, like, and knock off the probation because clearly nobody cared about the probation anyway and didn't intend to follow through on that <laughs> so there's that but like another thing that sort of came to mind with this in terms of the judge and her disposition towards these kinds of things is that in the u.s many judges are elected or appointed here they're i think they're appointed but there's no political component i don't think to the appointments um and so like the, in Connecticut, for example, judges are are suggested by, um, I think it's the governor. Let me see. I've got the notes. Uh, the judges of Connecticut Superior Court, the trial level courts, are selected through the assistant, assisted appointment method. The Connecticut Judicial Selection Commission is responsible for screening candidates and submitting a shortlist to the governor. The commission is made up of 12 members, six appointed by the governor and six appointed by leaders in the state legislature. The government must appoint a judge from the commission shortlist and the appointee must then be confirmed by the Connecticut General Assembly. Judges serve for eight years after their appointment. To continue to serve on the court, they must be re-nominated by the governor and re-approved by the General Assembly. So basically, in order to keep her job, this judge may have had to keep Keep on the good side of the Republican governor of the time in order to be up for reappointment. And so actually the governor at the time, her name was Jody Rell. She's a Republican, but she's fairly progressive for a Republican, although she was um, like, she's for the death penalty and for tightening conditions of parole. So other than those i'm not sure if she's generally tough on crime but i would assume that those two particular stances would make her the tough on crime type um which might influence this judge and her disposition on things maybe she goes a little bit harder because she wants to keep her judge ship under a conservative governor so uh, it's not the case here where judges have to capitulate to the political whims of the time or location where they are they just it, it's another job it's another public office where they don't have to worry about anything except their their morals and their ethics like upholding the expectations of their profession yeah and i i just i don't love that either because it can create such an immediate bias within a court system to put forth rulings that are not fair to any interested party because you're just trying to maintain your position when you essentially come up for review of, can I continue to be a judge? Having a third party political figure review your determinations within court to say like, Oh, I didn't really like some of those decisions because they're not in line with my personal political leanings. So I'm not going to allow them to be a judge anymore. Again, just the bias across the boards there in terms of inappropriate sentencing don't even get me started. It just blows my mind how that can even be a concept or a reality. Yeah. It's a whole thing. I don't like this judge. Um, you know, the judge says she doesn't care who Rory's family is, but she clearly does because she thinks they're rich and they're stuck up and that Rory does this stuff all the time and gets away with it. And she doesn't. And that's like, she's making an assumption based on people who are more like Logan, you know, and she's not taking into account this particular defendant, you know, it's not her job to pass judgment on Rory's character, except within the limited confines of her lack of criminal history, her general honesty and remorse for committing this crime and the likelihood that she'll ever commit a crime again. You know, the thing about punishment is it should be commensurate with what she did and should also aim to prevent recidivism 
Rory's not a great candidate for recidivism, you know? Like, jails are criminogenic, for one. So, like, this is another place where y'all need to calm down on just, like, send him to jail. Because <laughs> that's where people learn how to be better criminals, okay? You know, just if they're if they're not really a danger to anyone else and they didn't commit a violent offense and they're not obviously suffering from some sort of, you know, mental health condition that would render them unsuitable for interaction with the public going forward. Um, keep them out of jail. Diversion is by far the best way to deal with any of this stuff. You know, anger management, driving programs, uh, community stuff, um, drug programs, any of these kinds of things are typically much better ways to handle it at least for the first and maybe even the second offenses. If it starts becoming a real pattern of behavior, that's when you have to get stricter and just keep keep adding and adding. Once it's clear that they can't handle being in the community and, and doing these diversionary programs, only then should we really start talking about probation and, and jail. I think fines maybe because, it, because court is so resource intensive. Um, I think a fine given the offender's financial abilities, uh, a fine is perfectly appropriate, like literally pay back society, you know? But I just, I don't love this whole, in a way it's great to have this sort of depersonalized justice system where we're not seeking individual retribution for the harms done against us. But the thing I don't love about it is that sometimes it can get a little too depersonalized where suddenly victims are, are no longer really people. Um, in this case, it feels like the Zimmermans were ignored. And it's one of those things where part of me thinks that, you know, if Rory was going to have to pay a fine or restitution or, um, or partake in extensive community service, you know, if I were a judge, I'd be like, hey, Zimmermans, what do you want her to do? Do you have any particular causes that you think might be well served by Miss Gilmore? You know, and we don't do that. We're just like, go be supervised by the community service people, you know, and it's a another resource intensive process. So obviously she got 300 hours, which is seven and a half weeks of full time labor, which doesn't sound like that much. But most of the time you can't find seven and a half weeks full time. You know, you're doing a couple hours here, a couple hours there. There have to be open spots. You have to be like monitored and approved and it all has to sort of work out, which is why it took her the majority of the six months because we don't see her finishing her last hours until she's back with her mom. So if she was sentenced in June and not returning her community service vest until January when she returns back to Yale, it took her most of that time somehow to do those 300 hours. And so that's why, you know, it feels cumbersome because it's not just the hours at community service, but it's all of the administrative work behind that and, and fitting it around other things where it's not just like, okay, I'm going to get a job for seven and a half weeks. That's not how it works. Yeah. And I think it should have been taken into account too. When she said to the judge, like, you know, I'm still at school. Like I need to get an actual paying job as well. You know, this is going to prohibit me from doing a lot of those things. I think that need to be taken. I think that should have been taken into account as well. Again, considering that this was her first offense, and say, okay, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. Maybe 300 hours is like a little bit extreme, and I understand your need to want to be a valued member of society and contribute in that way and support yourself. So maybe, like again, compromise like 200 hours, work out some sort of deal. Um, you know, but it just completely depleted Rory. And, and this is, you know, one of the biggest reasons why I think she ended up dropping out of Yale just because she was already feeling that pressure before, but now this was going to be like an improbability for her. Like, how can you maintain a full, you know, course load when you're having to complete all of these hours? I just think the stress and the burden of all of it was just too much for her to handle. And, she just had to take a break from school when maybe had this judge been a little bit more lenient, that wouldn't have been the end result there. Yeah. She had already dropped out from Yale before the sentencing, but it might have prevented her from going back sooner because, you know, Logan was like, I give you a month, <laughs> you know, um, she may have changed her mind sooner and, and felt the boredom and felt ready to go back 
before the end of that semester um, had she not had to do all of this. So it's certainly something to to consider. And like the judge knew, she calls it out in the sentencing. Oh, you go to Yale. That's a very prestigious school. Like you could just hear, you can tell that she went to a state school. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. There seems to be some jealousy there or something like just the way that she said that. I'm like, you didn't go to Yale Law, did you? <laughs> no, clearly not. There are some great state law schools that it's not a dig at state law school. It's more just like the the overall like perception of especially Yale being one of the best law schools in the entire world. So she mm -hmm. might have had a chip on her shoulder for not being able to afford such undergraduate or uh, JD level education. Well, just grow, grow up, ma'am. I know, right? Grow up. <sighs> yeah. I don't know. And it's something, as I mentioned in the opening, I watch a lot of law tube. <laughs> so there's a lot of trials and, and situations that I've watched competent American lawyers break down. And, you know, one that came to mind as I was watching through it a couple months ago, this was February, March, I think. So I don't know how much everybody here knows about the Rust trial. So Alec Baldwin's production company was making a movie in New Mexico and it was an old timey Western had the use of a lot of guns, all, you know, prop guns, but they still fire blanks and, um, what's the word? Um, I already forgot what they're called. Dummies, Blank? dummy rounds. No. So blanks have some like a, a very particular tip and they have some explosive in them to make them seem like real bullets. And then dummies usually have no powder in them. And you can tell because they've got little like holes drilled in the side or they don't rattle or no, they put little balls in them. So they rattle when you shake them so that you know that there's no ammo powder in there. And so um, what happened on this movie set was um, a live round got mixed into a box of dummies and ended up in, I think, Alec Baldwin's holster. Well, I think there was one or two lives in his holster and one made it into a Colt 45 replica gun. And during a scene blocking session, so like they weren't filming, but you know, the directors were there, Baldwin, several other actors, um, you know, and then all the crew members as well. They were in this tiny little church and Baldwin was sitting in a pew. And so basically what's happening in the scene is uh, a marshal is coming in to try to arrest him. And he's sitting there with like his, his hand on his gun and he does a quick draw to try to like square down with, uh, and the guys, um, or the marshal is played by Jensen Ackles, mm -hmm. who's in Supernatural with Jared Padalecki. The whole thing is full circle. Anyway. <laughs> um, and so, Normally, this would be what they call a cold gun, where nothing in that gun, like they're all dummies, because you want it to look like they're real bullets, but you don't want blanks in there because they have a different look, right? And so the fact that one of these had gunpowder in it, he pulled the trigger, and it it went through the first AD, and also into the director's shoulder. And so, unfortunately, the first AD passed away from this, and the director also had to have surgery and was, you know, injured by this. And so, there have been several arrests made in in accord or in uh, in light of all of this, including Alec Baldwin. He stands trial, I think, next month. If if they can't get the indictment thrown out, which I mean, they've tried that before. Let's see if that happens. But a few months ago, the armorer faced trial on this and she was found guilty and sentenced to 18 months in jail but the um so what happened was she loaded the gun and didn't check it appropriately apparently and she handed it off to a guy named dave halls who was another first ad or no sorry helena hutchins was the director of photography not the first ad the first ad was dave halls so the guy who was supposed to second check the gun before handing it to Baldwin and the guy who claimed it as a cold gun and handed it to the guy who pulled the trigger got six months probation for handing a gun loaded with a live round that wasn't properly checked 
and that the gun went off and accidentally shot and killed a person. And he got six months probation. Six months. Rory got a year of probation and community service. OSHA was screaming about the failures of safety on the set. And, you know, there's still at least one more person to stand trial for this. The, like the kingpin, basically, the guy who runs the production company and who was the one who pulled the trigger. And Dave Hall has walked away with a plea deal for six months. And a f I think there was a fine. I don't know how much it was, but I think there was a fine. But it's just, it's heartbreaking because where's the justice in that? There's none to be had there from what I've seen thus far. None, none. And, exactly. I mean, I, I don't want to go off on it too much because, you know, obviously everybody's going to, I'm sure, have different feelings on what repercussions sentencing, if any, Alec Baldwin should face. I'm not here to weigh in on, in on that right now, nor will I. Um, but, yeah, just, just we're talking about Rory and what she faced, which was so much beyond what this person faced for the actual death of a, 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 a person. This is not just a fictional television show anymore. Someone died. And that's the justice for them? It, well, no, it wasn't it, all of it, but... Well, yeah. But I, I get what you're saying, Like, and, and it's an excellent point. Rory got hit harder for joyriding a boaty boat than someone actually losing their life. We need to do better. Yeah. And then I found a Canadian case that had some sort of echoes for me of, of Rory's situation. And I wanted to kind of give the, the details of that one. So this was a, well, the case that I was able to find is actually an appellate case out of Prince Edward Island um, from 2003. And so this was a young offender, they were 16 at the time, who stole a boat with his friend from a wharf in Prince Edward Island. Um, they took that boat to a bar. And again, remember, underaged. Even in Canada, it's 19. So still underaged. Uh, went to a bar where they met two women. The two People who stole the boat told the women that they stole a boat. Uh, the four proceeded to get on the boat and engaged in conversation and the consumption of alcohol. The young person started the boat using a key that was on the radio of the boat. Um, they got stuck in the boys and the muscle beds. <laughs> and the Coast Guard and the RCMP were notified. <sighs> when the authorities arrived, they gave a story that involved a, a fifth person who misled them, informing them that the boat belonged to him. <laughs> but then that fifth person mysteriously disappeared. Uh, like once they got stuck, fifth fictitious person bailed, naturally. <laughs> and so then the young woman told the authorities like, oh, they, no, they told us they stole this boat. <laughs> Which is like, don't get on the boat if they told you they stole the boat. That makes you an accessory, okay? That mm -hmm. makes you an occupant. <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, so the the person who was dealing with this this case, like one of the two young people who stole the boat, uh, pled guilty to the charges of joyriding, damages to property, and resisting arrest, and was sentenced. Obviously, he's 16, so the fact that he's a juvenile factors into his sentencing. So he was a first-time offender. He left school in grade 7 and had been working odd jobs ever since. Um, and so his, okay, so the provincial court judge sentenced the appellant to a term of three months in open custody, so community sentence, doesn't have to go to jail. She further placed the youth on probation for a period of 20 months from the date of release and ordered him to complete 20 hours of community service work on each of the four charges for a total of 80 hours. With regard to restitution, 500 was ordered for the damage to the muscle boys and $3,665 for damages to the boat. With the consent of the victims, he is permitted to perform personal service for $5 an hour to work off the amount. Lastly, he's obliged to send letters of apologies to the victim. And so, again, that one had damage to the boat, damage to 
like commercial fishery area mm -hmm. and underage drinking. <laughs> like, and he got just a couple months more of probation than she did and actually had to pay restitution and fines because there was damage. So again, like I would say that this set of facts is worse. You know, they lied to the cops. They, you know, they said, oh, there was a fifth person here. <laughs> they were drinking underage. It's just, it's all worse than what Rory did. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And, but I feel like that punishment is in line with the crime. You have to pay back for the damage that you caused to, you know, this commercial fishing area. You have to pay back the damage for the boat. It allows you to work out an agreement to pay off the owners and, and work for them to make reparations that way. Um, letters of apology. Um, and it probably was minimalized. Like, I don't want to say maybe minimalized is not the best word, but it was probably lesser than it would have been had he been an adult in the eyes of the court and above the age of 19 or 18. Um, but it fit the crime. Rory did not. And, and that's the difference here. And that's what I think is the point that we're trying to make. It's not that her actions are inexcusable because they're certainly not, but there were factors leading up to it um, stemming from the fact that she, you know, was just under a lot of undue stress, um, you know, was potentially contending with a lot of like emotional and, and mental, you know, well-being in, in not a great way based on what Mitchum had done in the lead up to this. And again, it doesn't excuse it, but those things as well in line with what actually occurred and the lack of damage and injury stemming from it needed to have been factored in with how the writers wrote out her sentencing and we never got it. And so it's just a disparity that I just, I don't think either one of us will ever understand. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that really nails the issue where it's like, it, it's the writer's fault because they wanted to make it super dramatic. And, you know, I think part of what gets me about it is that this probably wouldn't happen in real life. Rory would not be subject to this. And that makes it ring hollow, you know? And especially when this show is so, like, so much about critiquing the upper class and their privileges. Um, when you do something like this, that is write this kind of storyline into the show, it, it very much feels like they're stretching it in order to make that, that point. But it, it doesn't go over well because it's not realistic. Like, obviously, the show has a little bit of that fantastical element, but it just, you know, we know that it's wildly inappropriate. Mm -hmm. It just, it, it doesn't feel right. It's not supposed to sit right with us, I think. It's, it's supposed to feel wrong. Um, yeah, yeah, I just, it, it's supposed to drive that wedge. And it makes it hard for me to buy. And that's why I take issue with it. But yeah, I will say a uh, fun side note. I did love the insertion of like just comedic relief with Colin and Finn in this episode though, <laughs> um, at the Bridgeport police station when they're just going to pick up Logan and just trying to make jokes with the officer at the window um, and then bowing down to Rory, the Jean comment to Lorelai. Yeah. Um, again, this is a very serious scenario. Rory is in legal trouble here, but I love those moments. And, and just, I think it was a really good comedic relief insertion at that time. Again, even if not realistic, just something that yeah. I want to highlight because I appreciate it. My God, those are good Janes. <laughs> so good. Yeah. I love that uh, last fall after uh, fan fest, we, we made a little pilgrimage to the Bridgeport Police Department. <laughs> we did. And then to a uh, 
a restaurant overlooking a marina. I don't think it was the same one because this was almost certainly filmed in California. But like, mm -hmm. we, we found a place with Bodie boats and you sat and had oysters and I had drinks. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that, that was fun. Um, good time, good time. Yeah, everybody is all like, oh, I went to the Mayflower or I went to Hartford. I went to the Mark Twain Museum. No, we went to the Bridgeport Police Department. <laughs> that is the true fan pilgrimage to brave Bridgeport. I thought Bridgeport was going to be like hoity-toity, swanky, everything is very expensive. And it was not. Most of the town was kind of sketchy. <laughs> yeah, but so good to see. Check it off yeah. the list. Be warned, but ooh, I have another interesting like it's, it's not comparable entirely, but I just thought it was like an interesting um, point of comparison, but so Winona Ryder. <laughs> this was a fun one. So, well, sort of fun. Her life was kind of turned inside out with this one. But in 2001, she was arrested on shoplifting charges. She tried to steal apparently $5,500 worth of designer clothes from Saks Fifth Avenue. And for some reason, there were eight prosecutors working on this. And I'm like, there weren't that many prosecutors on the Alec Murdoch case, on the Rust case, on... Um, like most of the cases I've ever seen have had like maybe two DAs, <laughs> eight prosecutors. Are you kidding me to take down Winona Ryder? <laughs> like, what? Anyways. Um, and yeah, negotiations failed to produce a plea bargain. Um, she was accused of using drugs, including oxycodone, diazepam, and Vicodin without a valid prescription, but prosecutors dropped a drug possession count after it was proved that a doctor provided it to her as a medical treatment. She was convicted of grand theft and shoplifting, but was acquitted on the charge of burglary. In December 2002, she was sentenced to three years probation, 480 hours of community service, $3,700 in fines, and $6,355 in restitution to Saks Fifth Avenue, and was ordered to attend psychological counseling and drug counseling. <laughs> so, like, Rory Gilmore goes joyriding. Winona Ryder, 480 hours of community service, three years of probation, fines, restitution, like, 10 grand in money, 480 hours of community service, three years of probation. Like, and this was a, a rich, privileged woman who was, at the time, using drugs and stole from a large department store, you know, a, a company with great means. Um, and again, eight prosecutors. <laughs> I can't get over that. <laughs> Just I, tr I mean, L.A. has a huge district attorney's office, but that is something else for a shoplifting charge and $5,500 worth of theft. Just you got to get your five minutes of fame somehow. Oh, my God. I'm glad she's doing better and that she rebounded from this. But like, you know, she was an incredibly rich actress, public figure attempting to steal property she intended to keep that she was very much capable of just paying for. The prosecutor didn't want to offer her a deal, whereas in Rory's case, they were sympathetic. They were amenable to that. Um you know, she was going to be let off easy because she's a good kid from a good family who's never done anything like this before and isn't likely to do it again, you know? And obviously the drugs add a whole other layer of, of issue here, but, and that's, you know, why we have the drug counseling and the extended supervision, protracted probation, all these extra conditions. But like, what? <laughs> like the, ugh. Mm. Yeah, I just no. thought it was a, an interesting comparison because it's like, it's more, but is it like that much more? You tell me. It was overkill for certain for what she did. I mean, you know, we're acting like, you know, she ran someone down in the road. God forbid. But like, and again, I'm not excusing the crime because it is a crime she was stealing clothes. Let's look at what she's doing here and what the crime actually is in accordance with the response and the sentence to it. The response was just completely over the top. It obviously had to just be for publicity. And again, everyone wants their five minutes of fame. It's going to be news. It's going to, you know, make, put, 
money in, in people's pockets, but there are a lot of people out there who have committed way more serious crimes who have gotten off a lot less than probably even Winona for wanting some blouses and some skirts. Yeah. It's but true. our system is not flawed. We're fine. Overall, I think there are a lot of good things about the American legal system, including, you know, your intent on due purpose. Like it's, it's a good thing to have a system where there are checks and balances so that people don't get railroaded by the government for the smallest little thing. But yeah, there are issues. And so, especially in this case where it was relatively straightforward and, you know, nobody was hurt. Nobody was driving under the influence. There was no dangerous operation charge. It wasn't criminal negligence. There was no damage, very little financial implication whatsoever. So for her to get what she got in light of all of that, it's just like, again, you're, you're taking it too far. It's like that, that one bridge too far thing for the writers where it's just like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Almost got there. You almost had us. You could have done something different. Like they could have had a plot line where she owed three thousand dollars in restitution or something you know and and that required her to get a job and and pay them off slowly um but no it had to be community service it had to be let's forget that probation was ever a thing <sighs> yeah it just it crossed over into that unbelievable territory for me when i thought about it i was like this ain't right this is not in accordance with with sentencing principles that most judges would go by. Um, but yeah, let's spend the last couple minutes here talking about Lorelai's reaction to the whole thing. Because like, you know, you alluded to the scene in the police department and Lorelai says it to the cop in the booking area. You know, my daughter never gets into trouble, except, you know, now. But on the whole, the kid is an angel. She goes to Yale as if that's this like magical get out of jail free card, literally going to yell. Um, and then obviously this is echoed in the judge's sentencing remarks. And it's just like, what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like this, this is the mentality that Lorelai says she doesn't espouse and that Rory also doesn't seem to think she espouses of, you know, of privilege protecting you from life. And so she has this idea about like, Oh, she's such a good kid. She goes to Yale and yet she, she can't fathom that Rory has to pay the piper at all on this one. Yeah. I think her response was in line with what I would expect mm -hmm. to see in the police department of like, who wants to get a phone call? Like my kid got arrested, got arrested. Hey mom, I need you to come pick me up. I'm in, you know, jail. So to say, or like, you know, the local, precinct come please come get me um the drunk tank yeah was she in there by herself like is, is, is it a slow night did she have the cell alone like but when is she in the system <laughs> and what is rory, the system <laughs> yeah but when rory comes out and you just see lorelei's like just disappointment and disdain for her daughter at that moment of time of just like the you know well, do you have anything? And then there's just that really cold silence that felt truthful to me as like a, a parent child interaction. Obviously you're not going to be, you know, too pleased with your kid at that moment in time. But then the continued response and reaction that we get is her just completely cutting off ties with her daughter and with Emily and Richard, because she doesn't like the fact that they're not supporting Rory taking time off from school. We have the entire scene where she's talking with Emily and Richard, you know, in their bedroom. And Richard even blatantly says, like, we're going to need your support here. We need to all come together to support Rory and, and try and help her work through this and be there for her in that moment in time. And Lorelai is just like, nope, I'm out. You've won. She's yours. And the tie is severed at least in the short term until those reparations down the line start to be made. But what do you think of that moment where Lorelai, again, while she's talking to Richard, is just like, no, like 
I, I don't support your support of Rory here. I'm done with all three of you. Yeah, it was like Richard and Emily enabling her. That's what Lorelai didn't want. You know, she she didn't want them paying for Yale in the first place because she wants Rory to earn what she gets. And yet now <laughs> they're providing support in a different kind of way. And, and she's not okay with the level of control that they have wrestled from her, basically. Um, but as it pertains to the court case and the felony and all of that, you know, she's sort of like, we'll get you a lawyer. We'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. We'll make this go away. But then Logan calls her and is like, you should really let my dad handle this. He's got a lot of, or his lawyers have a lot of experience dealing with this kind of stuff. And she's like, you know what? I think we're okay. You know? And that's like, so we have the pride with not wanting Rory in Richard and Emily's clutches, but we also have the pride with not wanting the Huntsburgers getting their sticky little paws in this either because she doesn't trust them. And she especially no longer trusts Mitchum after what he said to Rory. She She's letting her own feelings about these people get in the way of what might be best for her daughter because as we see, uh, going it alone in the legal system can have long lasting repercussions. And I know that Lorelai doesn't want Rory to become, you know, a spoiled kid who just gets away with everything all the time. She doesn't want her to turn into Logan. Um, but the the lack of foresight of what could potentially befall Rory in court, I mean, we see that it doesn't really impact her, which is, again, the, the show not following through and on its own storylines. But, like, again, with the year of probation and five years of having a record how did rory even get a job on the obama campaign when she had a misdemeanor conviction on her record for property crime like what <laughs> you know that this could have long lasting impacts on her ability to find employment and to apply for certain things um if she truly wanted what was best for her daughter handle it outside of the court system you know if if that's not going to be beneficial to her if she's truly not going to learn her lesson if it's not going to make anybody better off in this scenario like <laughs> logan didn't get prosecuted on this you know his clearly went away and he never thought about it again he went off to europe for the summer and and never faced anything for this and i mean i love that he didn't face anything I don't love that he didn't face anything, but also, like, in the end, he was allowed to just kind of go back to be a, a normal college kid, and Rory wasn't. And so, it's, again, the show's commentary is like, Logan gets off scot-free because he's rich, and Rory doesn't because she's not, even though she is. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, they're trying to pretend the whole time like she is some angel with a halo who's above it all and who actually faces consequences because she's not rich and powerful and only logan gets off um and so it's this like weird version of social commentary that is hypocritical and backwards yeah it's not the first time we've seen it in the show not the last time we will see it either but i think you make just excellent end points there um, the punishment needs to fit the crime. It did not in Rory's case. Logan gets off scot-free, which again, could have been realistic. Like if you have good enough legal representation and if there is again, no property damage or injury and you just work out a deal with the owners of the boat and or the Coast Guard system, um, I, I can buy that, especially because it was, you know, Rory was the instigator. It was her idea to perpetuate this crime to begin with so as an accessory you're not going to have the same sort of repercussions and and fallout that you're facing but the whole way that this ended up going for rory was just very just untruthful and unfair and I don't think a good representation of the legal system of what people in her situation and people who are going through any sort of court system facing 
you know, minor crimes. Like we talk about, like we're jailing people for marijuana usage, which is just a drain on funds, keeping these people incarcerated. It, it you've talked about how putting people through a court system and trials for things like that is just also financially just taking up so many resources. We need to do better there with looking at what crimes people are actually facing sentencing for and then just let the punishment fit the crime. Exactly. I mean, I get it. You know, nobody likes when, especially when like rich privileged jerks get off scot-free. We have a lot of anger towards capitalism and, and rich jerks. So it feels like justice when rich people get a lot of time in prison. But, you know, people who are marginalized get more time in prison because they don't have the resources to defend themselves for, you know, lesser crimes. There are, you know, white collar criminals who have embezzled millions from people and, you know, impacted the financial livelihood of tons of investors, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there doesn't seem like much. But the, the grand scheme of things is very much so like a, a huge wide impact. Whereas in this case, it was like one family had their boat taken out and returned as is minus a little fuel. Like when you put it in the perspective of the impact of what they did, it's just not there. <laughs> you know, it, it, it feels like justice to see her get 300 hours of community service but like exactly how many pounds of flesh do people want you know what would actually satisfy you is this too much is this not enough and i totally understand just the sort of outrage at you know logan getting off totally free but would it change anything or make anyone better if he got punished harshly I don't think so. Like, he's a rich kid who's always going to have that privilege to save him regardless. And so it's like, is it going to make him do better? Probably not. <laughs> so I just, I think that it's sort of shallow commentary. It would have maybe been more fun to see Logan get his instead of Rory, because we've followed Rory for all of these years and we know who she is at her core is, you know, a people pleaser, a rule follower, um, a, a generally nice person, even if maybe she has her moments of like, well, that was thoughtless. But, you know, like, it would have been better to see Logan face up because he's probably the one who had the knowledge and means of how to take a boat in the first place. So even though it was Rory's idea, he was probably the one literally driving the ship. So that would have been a fun plot line too. And, you know, maybe Logan grows from that experience and, and he and Rory have to work through that together. And, you know, Rory still gets something as the blowback from that. But like I said, maybe she has to pay off fines or restitution instead, because that would be an, a more appropriate sentence than just sort of this like amorphous community service. And yeah, I don't know. I just, I think, Going back to my, I feel like I've gone off the, the deep end, but like going back to my initial question of like Lorelai's reaction to the whole thing. It feels kind of wrong to say, but I think she should have gone with Mitchum's lawyers. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, the best thing for Rory in the circumstance would have been to not have a criminal record for five years. It's, you know, at the end of the day, it's not about how much community service she does from a mother's perspective, that is like we, as the audience who have a parasocial relationship with her mm -hmm. and we've seen kind of what she's been up to and we don't like it. We want her to correct the behavior, but, but that's the thing. Like, do we really truly think that she would ever do something like this again? No, <laughs> that's half the point of, of being put through the criminal justice system is to deter people from doing it again. And I really don't think she would. And so if she had gotten off a little bit easier, not much would have changed because she probably would have been like, I am never doing something that stupid again. Whereas Logan is the one who actually kind of needs it. He needs more than just a slap on a wrist or daddy magically making it go away. And so Lorelai, if she was truly wanting to do what was best for Rory would have been like, I'm going to do whatever it takes so that my kid doesn't have a criminal record. 
And if that means she skates on this one, that's just what it is. Yeah, I will concur in saying that if you want the best for your kid, and that was that is what Lorelai has always professed for Rory, um, you need to swallow a little bit of pride here as much as you hate Mitchum for the words that he has said to your daughter and how he has made her feel. Um, and not dismiss that, but recognize in this moment, this is so much more important in terms of, again, keeping her record clean. And she should have gone with his lawyers. I will agree with you on that all day, every day. All right. Is there anything else you have on this topic? We've already gone longer than we said we were going to. Classic. What a surprise. Um, never no, happens. I, I, I think we uh, never, never. But I think we've covered everything here. Um, anything else that you want to add? No, I think that covers most of my notes. Yeah, I think we're good. Um, if you've been watching this and you have, an, again, any of your own thoughts on Rory's sentencing, this entire, uh, these series of episodes from her felony to her arrest afterwards and the court appearance, um, please drop us a comment and let us know whether you feel it was fair, whether her punishment should have been harsher, whether it was too harsh. We would love to hear your thoughts and your hot takes as well. So just let us know where you stand. Exactly. And, uh, you know, we are going to keep reminding you mm -hmm. as long as it's necessary uh, that the Fan Fest is coming up in, I think we're at 20, 20 weeks, 21 weeks 20, at yeah. this point. Um, October 18th to 20th in Guilford, Connecticut. We will be gathering once again to celebrate all things Gilmore. It's just a great fandom event where awesome people come together to hang out, to meet cast and crew, to do silly things like sing karaoke and make newspaper hats <laughs> and do trivia and bingo and games and attend panels. It's just so much fun. And the, the cast and crew lineup for this year is incredible. We have links in our description to the, uh, the Facebook page and the Instagram page for the FanFest Society where you can see all of the announcements for that. And something that has been finalized since we recorded last, which is, like I said earlier, a long time ago, um, they're also doing a cruise <laughs> at the end of January. We're not sure if we're going to be able to make it, but um, I think it's January 24th to 27th, Fort Lauderdale to the Bahamas. And they've already announced uh, Shelly Cole, Nick Holmes, and Olivia Hack. So that is shaping up to be a, a great event as well. I think you have to sign up by September 1st and you have to make a full payment for your room. But again, the uh, the FanFest links below will have information for that if you're interested in a celebrity cruise with the cast of Gilmore Girls. <laughs> so don't forget to check those out. Yep. And if you have any questions about any of those events, please always send us an email as well. Our contact information is also in the description below. We're happy to answer any questions you may have about the cruise or the event this fall in Connecticut. We really hope especially to see you there this fall. Um, we will definitely be running a Gilmore's Against Humanity game panel that weekend, um, which we are already in full swing preparing for. Um, so it's just, again, the most spectacular and fun weekend and we can't talk it up and hype it up enough. So please consider just checking out the links below and buying a ticket because you will not be disappointed if you attend. We promise. It's true. And next week, come back and join us again. Uh, if memory serves, I think next week is uh, just going to be a fun, lighthearted special episode. Um, in our interim, like in the, the time we've had off, um, a little thing happened called the release of the tortured poets department. <laughs> I don't know and, what that is. Um, never heard of it. Who's Taylor Swift anyway? <laughs> Ew. Nobody. Who's Taylor Swift? Um, so <laughs> we were at Target a couple weeks ago and you were like, we should do a, a Taylor Swift episode. And so that's what's going to be happening next week. Um, what we're going to do is sort of like a, if Taylor Swift wrote Gilmore Girls, Lorelai's version. So we're making a playlist of sort of like the songs that correlate to Lorelai's arc, especially her romantic one, because that's where Taylor Swift's true gift lies is in expressing those kind of uh, emotions within a relationship. And so 
we're going to kind of go through and do a lyrical analysis of several Taylor Swift songs as they pertain to Gilmore Girls. So next yep. week it's going to be Lorelai, and the week after that's going to be Rory. Yep, please come back and join us for that. Um, you know, whether or not you're a Taylor Swift fan, I think there's good content to be had there regardless. And we're just really excited to just, you know, um, have these sort of special episodes lined up for you guys. We're really excited to talk about it. So we hope that you will come back and join us for that. In the meantime, go back and check out some of our old episodes. Um, we just did a series on Christopher as a dad, um, which we had a lot of thoughts about as well. So go back and listen to that. Um, in the coming weeks, we're hoping to do an actual fan fest episode, just again, continuing to hype up the event. We'll, uh, talk about that more as we get that finalized. Um, but just stay, uh, deep into the Gilmore girls universe folks, you know, whether it's our content fan fest, just stay here with us because we got a lot of really good stuff coming up. It's better to be in stars hollow than pretty much anywhere else. Literally. <laughs> and on that note, we'll see you next Friday for dinner. Court is now adjourned. Cheers. Bye.